Okay, so we're going, we're running again. We're all good? Yeah. Um, okay, well why don't we kick off and uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, somebody on the call has um, uh, microphone issues, I think, so it's quite noisy at this end. Alan, I think it's you, uh, kicked in when you arrived. But if we can, uh, I understand there's some people on the conference call, the audio conference call as well. Is there anybody on the conference? I heard a beeping. No, that's okay. Well, look, thanks everybody for coming along. Anyway, this is uh, the, the kickoff of the the Fair Deal uh, Consortium, I suppose we want to call it. Uh, we are uh, a collection of like-minded organizations and uh, individuals from around the globe now who are looking at supporting a fair deal for uh, innovators and for uh, local customers and users as well as uh, for the people who are creating content themselves. We are kicking off uh, with our website, ourfairdeal.org. Uh, which uh, is up and running and where we can uh, get people to sign up to support some of the initiatives. And we're trying to couch it in a very positive way. We're, we're not looking to um, uh, repeal copyright laws or anything of that sort. What we're looking to do is uh, maintain uh, the status quo as it is between um, uh, users and producers of copyright material. We're not very keen on uh, extending copyright terms for uh, at least 70 years uh, after an author's life, for example. Uh, we're very keen to make sure that restrictive digital locks don't exclude us from being able to access content in the way that we as, as uh, users uh, are choosing to access content. Parallel importing is a, is a critical issue, particularly for those of us who don't have access to uh, direct sources of uh, both content and uh, services online. And uh, uh, as Internet NZ is, is uh, often quoted as saying, this is about keeping the Internet open and uh, uh, free for all. So uh, without any further ado, I shall hand over to a pseudo uh, Neil James is, is a wolf, but um, uh, we have a stand in. Yep. Hi, I'm uh, Kevin Prince, the uh, Manager of Digital Accessibility at the Royal New Zealand Foundation of the Blind. Um, Apologies to all who are expecting Neil, I, I shall try and do him justice. Uh, he's fairly sick uh, and had hoped to be here today, but uh, still hasn't quite made it, I'm afraid. Um, what we both thought we'd do is, if you can imagine I'm Neil, I shall read his, his words, so I hope that doesn't come across too much as a prepared statement. So, if, if you can imagine I'm Neil, um, Hi, I'm, my name is Neil Jarvis and I head up the Accessible Information Portfolio at the Royal New Zealand Foundation for the Blind. The Foundation is New Zealand's main provider of sight loss services to people who are blind or have low vision. I'm also President of the Roundtable on Information Access for People with Print Disabilities. That's a seriously long name. Made up of organisations in Australia and New Zealand dedicated to promoting access to information. I'm also proud to be on the board of the DAISY Consortium, a global consortium of organisations committed towards creating the best way to read and publish. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'd like to explain why this is so important by telling you a little bit about my own story, as I say. Please imagine I'm Neil. Um, I'm blind. I was born without sight and have been a lifelong user of accessible information. I want to begin by asking you all to close your eyes. Now think about how much of a role the written word plays in your life. Imagine not being able to enjoy your daily read of the newspaper over a morning coffee, or being able to escape into your favourite novel. You can't read your emails and text messages, or perhaps watch a good film. I think we all agree that we live in a sighted world saturated by words. In reality, these words are not easily accessed by me and 285 million other people like me in the world. I used to dream of being able to walk up to a machine and have it give me all the information my friends and family could get so easily. There were so many words that I wished I could soak up, like those of you who are sighted take for granted. I wanted to stand for granted. I wanted a standard practice that people with a disability can access whatever they want in the way that works for them. For instance, the junk mail we all get in our letterboxes is something I want a choice to read or to throw away. Can we mute their mics, please? I think it's Ellen. Sorry, Ellen. Ellen, can you mute your mic in the top in the top corner of the screen? There's a mute button. People like me experience a famine when it comes to accessible information. Less than 5% of the published material in the world is available in formats which are truly accessible to people with a print disability. 
One of our functions at the Foundation of the Blind is to ensure that Kiwis who are blind or have low vision get better access to information than has traditionally been the case. One way in which we do this is by producing alternate accessible format versions of printed materials. Such formats include braille, large print, electronic text and audio. I consider access to information a basic human right and there are a variety of ways that I'm able to fulfill this desire. I got through my school and university years using a combination of braille, old fashioned tape recorders and a good old trusty manual typewriter. It wasn't easy but I was motivated. I still use braille on a daily basis and cannot imagine life without it. Although braille was invented in 1824, the advent of electronic information has given us more opportunities to use braille than ever before with refreshable braille displays allowing us to read electronic braille through our fingertips. I also use a computer with keyboard commands in place of the mouse and special technology which reads out the text on the screen. I marvel at the information I'm able to access through the internet. Blind people also have access to literature and stories through audio. One of the most exciting projects I've been involved with in the foundation is the introduction of a new digital talking book system, DAISY. Moving on from the cassette-based talking books, which are now practically obsolete, DAISY allows talking books to be read almost as a sighted person reads a printed book. We are now able to find page numbers, search chapters, and mark our place. Which brings me to why I'm here today, or not. The only way of producing this information is through, sorry, the only way that producing this information is possible is through current New Zealand copyright legislation. This legislation recognises the specific interests of print disabled people through special exemptions. Specifically in New Zealand, Section 69 of the 1994 Act enables organisations like the Foundation to produce copies or adaptions of published works in Braille or other alternate accessible formats without infringing copyright. Much has changed in the world of information access over the past few decades, though the desire to read and to have access to the same written materials as everyone else remains. Anything which might put this hard one right at risk is a matter of great concern to me, along with more than 11,500 other New Zealanders who are members of the Foundation. For me, it all goes back to being a child with an unquenchable thirst for reading and finding things out, yet being frustrated by the lack of accessible material. Lack of access is still a problem for many people, but this is improving. I often say there has never been a better time to be blind. Let's not step back in time. We fully support the rights of authors, publishers and other rights holders to protect their copyright material. However, this should not be at the expense of those who cannot make use of standard print or technology solutions which are inaccessible to print disabled people. We know that the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations are confidential, but I must stress, if copyright is considered within this agreement, I encourage you to keep the interests of the blind community close to your heart. Thank you. Thanks, Neil slash Kevin. Uh, right, we've got some other members of the coalition here uh, in the room and also uh, on the Google Hangout. Uh, where do we want to start? Who's, who's up first? Perhaps if we start in the room, if you'd like to say anything at all. Yeah, yeah. I'm Bronwyn Boyce, from the Creative Freedom Foundation. I'm also joined by Daniel Jones, who's also a trustee. Um, and I, let's see. If I can maybe just introduce our organisation, um, those who are not aware of us, uh, the Creative Freedom Foundation is a not-for-profit organisation that advocates for New Zealand artists. We are artists ourselves, and we are particularly interested in copyright law changes. At present, we have around 20,000 members. Um, so I have a prepared statement um, as well. I'm quite concerned about the transitive touch Right, so um, as, I'll just read it. as New Zealand artists, for us one of the biggest issues at stake in the TPP is the extension of the duration of copyright. As artists we acknowledge that a limited copyright term is useful, but there is a point where excessive durations start to cause problems for artists. Copyrights given to artists for a limited time so that we can exclusively control copies of our work with the idea that this will enable us to make more work. Uh, it's important to remember that copyright is a temporary monopoly, not a form of property. When it expires, uh, if a work, when it expires on a work, the work falls out of copyright and into the public domain. At this point, it becomes a public resource that artists can and do draw from in the creation of new work. This fact also has significant economic implications for artists. 
of course, billion dollar empires have been built from the public domain, while Disney's company remits public domain stories like Snow White, Cinderella, and Beauty and the Beast. In New Zealand, the lack of copyright on Shakespeare has allowed us to translate it from The Merchant of Venice and Te Reo Māori, keeping it relevant for Kiwi audiences. An extension of the copyright term will dramatically reduce the number of works we're currently legally and freely able to sample taking from us what was already being promised under the law. If taking copyrighted works without permission is stealing from copyright holders, then surely if the, government, if the government agree to a copyright extension in the TPP, they will be stealing up to 70 years worth of public domain works from us. The US are trying to convince Minister Tim Grosser that their excessive copyright terms won't harm New Zealand artists, but they will. They will prevent New Zealand artists from doing exactly what Walt Disney did. When copyright was invented, it was only for 14 years, but over the decades this has repeatedly increased, and in most countries it now lasts for at least life plus 50 years, as per the Berlin Convention. For literary, dramatic, musical or artistic works, New Zealand artists currently have their lifetime plus 50 years worth of protection for their works. This term could stretch under the TPP to life plus 70 years. Sound recordings and films could more than double up to 120 years, currently 50 years. While it's important to uphold copyright duration for a period of time to give artists the opportunity to make profits from their work, as artists we acknowledge the benefit we've received from the shared community of the public domain. Our government has spent a lot of time and taxpayers' money on copyright enforcement. Once upon a time, copyright enforcement was straightforward regulating expensive and uncommon industrial manufacturing processes. Now it's trying to regulate what people do in the privacy of their own homes on internet connections. Because of this, copyright lawmakers and negotiators must focus on a new area, public relations. As artists, we need to be careful that copyright isn't turned into something that loses public respect for us and our works. For copyright to be respected in the modern age, it needs to earn it. It needs reasonable copyright duration, durations. It needs to allow parity and satire protection for artists, like Australia and America do. And for crying out loud, it's the year 2013. New Zealand copyright law still says you aren't allowed to circumvent PPM to watch legally purchased DVDs on your iPad. Bad copyright law will be bad for us and bad for our heritage, alienating our fans, creating public scepticism about a system that's seen as unfair, and blocking our ability to build on other ideas and to participate in global culture. In fact, one of the reasons the Creative Freedom Foundation exists is to ensure that the extremist views represented in New Zealand by the likes of NZ Fact and Reason aren't the only artistic voices heard, because heavy-handed views like that can and do negatively affect all artists. We urge the Minister Tim Grosser not to harm artists and copyright itself by increasing its duration when it will benefit so few and harm so many. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Consumer, you guys have, uh, this is Hayden from Consumer. Leave nothing officially prepared. Oh, drag up the microphone. Good, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm Hayden Green, um, tech writer at Consumer New Zealand. Um, we joined this fair deal um, campaign, mainly because the TPP is going to get rid of parallel importing. For New Zealand consumers, uh, parallel importing has been around for a relatively short amount of time in the, in the span of things, um, coming into the late 90s. But what it's done is it's opened up the markets that we don't have. Uh, New Zealand consumers are constrained heavily by um, what they, they can and cannot get. And um, the ability to buy things over the internet, to buy things parallel imported from stores like uh, the warehouse, which has almost built its entire business on parallel importing, uh, is very important. The, the TPP, um, as far as we know, because as we all around the table understand, it's a very secretive agreement. Uh, as far as we know, it does have provisions in there which may remove uh, parallel importing uh, in New Zealand. and may set up uh, systems where companies can list the price overseas and that is the only price that you can get it for uh, in New Zealand through official channels. There will be no um, other uh, 
uh, sell as available. We don't like this. It doesn't stand for consumer um, rights in any kind of way. So Consumer New Zealand is completely opposed to this. And um, in, a, in a very nice turn, uh, we, when we looked up the last time parallel importing was debated in Parliament, the current national uh, government, which was in opposition at the time, agreed with us. So that was handy. So as long as they don't change their view that they held a few years ago, we should all be fine. So thanks. Thanks, Adi. Don, do you want to uh, join in from NZ Rise? Sure, okay. Um, I'm Don Christie. I'm co-chair of NZ Rise, an organisation set up to represent the local digital and IT community of businesses, so we've got a particular business focus. Um, some key points we'd like to point out. One is that there has yet to be any economic analysis done on the uh, cost or benefits of the proposed IP chapters that we've seen so far, and without that, I don't see how any country can sign up to this agreement because that's incomplete. Secondly, as businesses, we're really concerned about the enforcement regimes and the copyright regimes in the IP section, which uh, load up consumer and businesses alike with massive liability. Uh, I think, as Bronwyn was pointing out, that it would seem that there's not much uh, activity that takes place on the internet if you're a consumer these days that isn't illegal. That's the sort of um, legislative framework that totalitarian states uh, enjoy. So we're really concerned about that. We're concerned about the um, impact that has on innovation. And I point out that these sort of agreements that focus not on activity but on technology um, are misplaced. The activity of copyright infringement has long been uh, illegal, and that's uh, something that um, as societies we can agree or disagree with. But focusing on the technology that uh, people can use in many, many different ways, including infringing and non-infringing ways, we think is a mistake. Finally, nobody here has touched on the uh, health implications of the IP chapter. Um, as businesses, many of us uh, offer free health insurance for our employees, uh, and we'd be very concerned that the pharmaceutical uh, industry demands for uh, much longer patent terms and uh, patent linkages will uh, make access to reasonable health in New Zealand expensive, and that will be something that drives up the cost of doing business in this country. Thanks, Don. Uh, online on Google Chat, I understand we've got someone from Lima. Hi, Maria. Are you keen to uh, make a statement or join in at this point? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes very well. Yes. Great. <laughs> Perfect. I'm actually muted on my Google chat and I'm on a conference call, so I'm, I'm glad that's working. I'm sorry if my internet shuts out at any moment. Um, I'm Myron Sutton. I'm with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, we are based in San Francisco. We are a digital civil liberties organization that has been around for over 24 years. Um, we are primarily a law firm uh, representing uh, startups, innovators, researchers, students, um, a broad range of interests um, and defending them against uh, you know, misuses of digital policy or um, cases where digital policy um, is being uh, interpreted in a way uh, that, that harms free speech, innovation, and privacy um, with, with technology and, um, and the internet. So, um, I've been following the TPP for about uh, a year and a half now, and um, and I've, this is the fourth round of the TPP negoti negotiations I've been to, um, and this time it's in Lima, Peru. Um, my colleague, Katisa Rodriguez, uh, has been on the ground in Lima for the last three weeks, and um, and she has sort of, I've, I've been calling her sort of um, a catalyst for, or an enzyme, <laughs> we're calling her an enzyme, for activity. So, trying to get um, labor groups and health groups and um, hackers and um, digital rights groups. There's a digital rights group um, here called Iper Um And we've been, we've been uh, getting them all um, activated on the ground against TDP because 
um, while they've been working on policy domestically, 